saw the original design. You know, it looks good, but some of the bunkers just don't make sense to me. And he goes, well, what do you mean? And I go, well, I just don't understand why there's a bunker like here. And he goes, well, what way is the hole playing? I went, oh my goodness, you can play it in reverse. They are two completely different golf courses. So it's built on the same land. So it's 18 holes that plays 36. Because of the different way it's routed, you have different horizon lines, you have different tree lines, different sunsets, you have different wind directions. Uh, it's, it's a completely different golf course. A lot of courses are manufactured and we've got them with waterfalls and what are, you know fountains and, and all this kind of stuff now and then they didn't have all the powerful machinery to move all that earth and do all those things back in those days. This is kind of a, a, a throwback to the origins. I want to do things that are different. I don't want to keep building the same golf course every time. You know, that was just like a super challenging idea. When our owner at the time, Lou Thompson, w was talking to architects to, to build us a second course, he wanted something that would wow people, uh, something that would get people to stay multiple nights, and then also he wanted something totally different than Forest Dunes. When I accepted the head pro position here at Forest Dunes, the GM at the time had, had let me know that there was a possibility of a second course. It was spoken of, but we weren't really sure it was gonna happen. I was actually down in Detroit at a gathering, and and I said there that, you know, I've been doing a bunch of projects like all over the planet. I hadn't built a golf course in Michigan in 20, Five years, and I, you know, I've lived in Michigan the whole time. Two of the guys that I was talking to the next day, they were in an event at Forest Dunes, and they heard them talking about that they might be doing another course, and they were like, "You need to talk to Tom." So Lou Thompson called me. I mean, compared to some of the dramatic pieces of land I had worked on in the last ten years, this property wasn't all that. It was, it was nice and gentle rolling ground. Some of the trees had been logged off over the years, so there was some trees left, but you know, not like giant specimen oaks or anything like that. Tom came over to, to meet with Lou. We, we had heard he had something up his sleeve, off the charts different. You know, I'd had this idea for years of do, building a golf course that you could play forwards and backwards. You know, the idea came from a book I read when I was like 15 years old that one of the old architects that worked in Europe, Tom Simpson, in the back of his book, he had a little like six page thing about doing a reversible course. He would build a, a private course for the Rothschilds on their estate. They, so they'd build like three holes. And of course that would get really boring if you just played the same three holes over and over again. So he did it that it was reversible. But he drew a very simple diagram of it in his book, just, and you could tell how different that would be just playing the other way around. So it just always stuck in my mind is like, that would be really cool if you could actually pull that off and do a good job with it. On top of that, Lou was not really a guy who'd been in the golf business forever. And I thought maybe he's just different enough to think this is a cool idea instead of like, telling me 10 reasons why it won't work. We already had a top 100 public course uh, in the country uh, with the Wisecough Forest Dunes course. 
So he's, he's going to want to bring something that, uh, you know, stands up against that at, at least. I honestly didn't think I would ever find a client that wanted to do it. But I did have an idea of what kind of site you needed to have to do it. And it had to be fair. It has to be fairly flat because otherwise, you know, when you're playing like over a valley to a ridge and over a valley to another ridge, you have to get those distances right and they don't work so well backwards. Had to be kind of flat, had to have not too many big trees because you can work around it the one way, but it's right in the way for the other way. You know, it just, for some reason, I, I didn't really have that on my mind at the start, but as soon as I started walking the ground, I'm like, okay, it's not spectacular ground, but it actually might work for this constant. They've been playing golf on sandy ground in Scotland for three or 400 years. This whole, the whole Western half of Michigan is sandy. So it's a great place to build golf courses. The sand is 99% of what you're looking for, right? That's why everybody looks for these sand sites to do all to do the building on. It 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 makes it makes it so much easier. If you got heavy soil that doesn't want to drain, you know, it's it's hard to manage when, when Mother Nature drops rain on you and, and things like that. When you have a sandy site that drains really well and yeah, it has its frustrations because it drains so well and things, you know, get hot and, and you gotta constantly be on your toes, but I have the ability to, to add the water a lot easier. I can't take it away when, when, when Mother Nature puts too much out there. So the sand really, really helps. When I worked for Pete Dye, the idea in the business, he'd spoiled it for everybody. It was like, you could give him a swamp and he could turn out the TPC at Sawgrass. So he kind of, de-incentivize clients to go find a good piece of land to work on. And, you know, and there were a lot of bad golf courses built back then under that premise. You know, to, to do what he did at the TPC, that's like a one in a million thing. And, and, you know, but even if you look at the rest of the golf courses Pete Dye did, TPC's great, but his very best golf courses were built on the better pieces of land that somebody gave him. It's just a huge head start. You know, if you've got a really attractive piece of land and it's got some cool natural contours, that's, you know, figuring out how to use those things is a lot easier than trying to create it off of scratch. He and his team did not really have to move a lot of earth. The natural land and the shape of it, the few elevation changes and the way the ball runs out, the way the design materialized is from what has been given. Tom is very much a, a minimalist. The business had gone so far in the other direction at that point that I just thought when I started it, if I'm gonna miss, miss on the side of doing too little to the land instead of too much, because everybody else was doing too much. That forced me to do what I thought was the most important part, which is focus on the greens first and the bunkers second, and let most of the rest of it just kind of follow the natural flow of the land. Routing didn't take a lot longer than normal because you can't really route things two ways at the same time. You're finding holes one way and then trying to figure out how to make them playable the other way. So during construction, the way that I routed the golf course, I sort of handed off those holes to Brian Slonick, who was running the job for me and said, you think about the holes, how the holes play this way. And you know, we would we would sort of compare notes about like, okay, where do you, you know, where do you think a fairway bunker would be interesting? And it's like, no, that's that'd be right in the way, going my way. To make it work both ways, you actually had to simplify things and strip things out. You know, if you I mean just the idea of bunkers in general, you know, the the more you try to make the bunker visible from one direction, the less visible it is from the other. You know, if you build up a mound and cut the cut the bunker into the face of the mound, you only see the back side of the mound from the other direction, unless you build another bunker into the other side. 
And I, you know, I think that's one of the reasons it works so well is we knew to not overcomplicate things. The loop has more of the little like wumply undulations in the fairways than than the Renaissance Club does. I mean, our fairways are more like some other Scottish courses that do have that kind of land wall to wall. That was the inspiration for them. But, um, but you, you don't really, generally you don't find that kind of land much in America. But that wound up being one of the main challenges of the golf course is that you don't, you know, there's not a lot of fairway bunkers there, but you don't have very many level eyes for your second shots. And there's that kind of contour on the approach to the green too. So. You know, since you have, since you can't just fly it on the green and make it stay, you have to account for some of that in your approach shots too, which very few courses in America really does it matter what the undulations are on the approach. People are trying to fly that. You may have a drivable par four, which seems, you know, gettable, but the green is the defense. And in the same way, you may have a reachable par five with a very difficult green, but the green is the defense. So it may be an easy par, but it's not an easy birdie. Uh, I think a lot of average golfers, um, even those who appreciate, appreciate architecture, maybe don't understand what the designer had in mind in each particular one. For it to be interesting, golf has to be somewhat challenging to people, but everybody's at a different level. The one place where that kind of all comes together is when you get to the green. You know, you have to build a hole with like a 300 yard carry now to make a tour pro think twice about what they're doing. And for most people, obviously that's impossible. They, they can never, you know, so you, know you, you put tees in all kinds of different places, but really you just try to not have very many do or die forced carries. So the one place you can challenge everybody kind of at the same level is around the greens. And, and there's really, you know, there's all sorts of skill levels of players around the greens too, but it's not, you could have an 80 year old woman who's a decent putter. So it's not like, you know, unlike the tee to green game, you're not ruling out anyone physically by making the greens more interesting. So I've always kind of focused on that part and, you know, let, let a lot of the rest of it sort itself out. If you take a, a low handicap golfer who may be able to drive the ball 300 yards at a, at a peak trajectory and a peak spin rate, and you take the average golfer who maybe can hit it 250, 260, 270, but at more of a boring trajectory, it evens out. So even off the tee, if you hit two straight shots, I play with my dad out there quite a bit. He's 75 and he's a good player. Uh, many times we're in a similar situation because my ball flight may be optimized and his catches the contour and rolls out. So that kind of um, evens out the playing field for a lot of amateurs. Ten of the 18 greens you play as a par three, one way or another. You know, normally you're thinking about building four par threes on the golf course. Building ten is a lot different. And you, you know, you're trying to make them different than each other. And like, I never had to make ten par threes that were all different than each other before. But I think we did pretty well with that. I, you know, that's the main thing I like about them is that they're very different. And, you know, the funniest one to me is that the way we worked it out, like the, the, the shortest of the 10 is the sixth hole in the red course, which is just like 120 yards or something like that. And, you know, plays across some native stuff. And the green is kind of at the angle you're playing, at the angle you're playing that ball, the green is wide and shallow and it's kind of hard to hold. And it falls off. And then the longest of the 10 par threes is uh, 13 on the black, high T, high green, 220 yards. You know, you have to hit it a long way and then the green mostly slopes away from you. There's just a little bit sloping towards you and it kind of goes over the hill and a lot of the green sloping away from you. And those two holes are in the, they're, they're the opposites of each other. They're in the same ground. I mean, the T for number six red is at, the, is at the start of the fairway going up to the green of the long par three. I was fascinated we could build two holes that were that different, basically using the same airspace. And, and the rest of them worked out the same.
There's a lot of people who act like every hole that's a par four should be kind of the same level of difficulty. Like if you build a short par four, you should make a really hard green. If you build a long par four, you should make a really big green that's easy to hit because you're, hit, you're hitting from farther away. And I kind of understand that in terms of fairness, but I just, you know, to me that makes every hole feel more the same. And I'm trying to make them feel as different as possible from one another. And one of the best ways to do that is just vary the length. Have holes that are, you know, it's, it's almost short enough to be a par three. And in theory, that should be easy, but then, then I've got more license to do tricky things to make it a little hard. And, you know, those are the holes that the average guy has the best chance to make par or even birdie. And the surprising part is there are also holes that put pressure on the really good player because they think they should make birdie or they need to make birdie to, to keep, stay even with the other guy. And if they don't, they get frustrated. If they make par on an easy hole, they're mad. And you know, if if I'd have toughened the hole up, they wouldn't they wouldn't get so upset. And you know, it might not you know, but they're more affected playing the next couple holes after something like that. And you know, I think that's part of golf. I think you you want to get reactions from players like that. feedback I've got, the best feedback I've got is, it's like a totally different course. Like I wouldn't have even realized that I was on the same piece of property, you know, until I missed in the same spot on both, both holes. It's like, I it just didn't register that it was the same thing at all. So other places you go, places I've worked at, you may have the ocean, you may have a lake, you may have mountains, you may have something out in the distance that gives you a visual. The course itself is the star. So there are a couple places on the back side of the golf course where you kind of have the horizon line of, you know, just kind of northern Michigan trees, uh, but there are no water hazards. Um, there's not huge elevation change. It's the design and the functionality of a course that plays in two directions. That's the reason people come. journey and you don't really know where you are what's coming next I think that's a good thing in routing a golf course it's hard to do usually it's like okay I know that hole over there must be 16 going back um, but it's nice when you can when it just feels natural and yet you don't you wind up not knowing what's coming next